Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to be talking about rescuers tonight. Um, hopefully not too long because my group is in about 20 minutes. But I'm going to be talking to you about um, the personality which we call the rescuer. And you may or may not relate to this, but it will be super helpful for you to listen because you might know somebody who's a rescuer. Those type of people that, you know, um, it's always there. How can I help? Who do we go to? Who do we run to for every time something goes wrong? The grandmother who we turn to and says, you know what, everything's going to be okay. Come on, you know, come over to my house. I'll fix it all. You know, I understand, you know, that you're struggling. I understand that you need help. That's essentially the rescuer. Now, you often get a lot of um, rescue personalities in, in therapy and they come around the time when they start to realize that rescuing people has its downfall okay so on one hand it looks really noble to be a rescuer you know to help people and to be there for people and you know put your needs at the back foot you know it's it's noble it's heroic and you kind of feel like yeah i'm doing something great but there is a downside to being a rescuer. So let's talk about the roots of a rescuer. How does somebody become a rescuer from the beginning? Well, when we look at childhood of a rescuer, often it's the parents or the primary caretakers who often said to them, look look how helpless I am. You know, it's a mother who had lots of siblings and said to one of the children, I need your help. I can't do it without you. Can you not see how busy I am? And so that child kind of puts on his cape and says, yes. You know, I can do that. I can fix things. Um, and sometimes it's in from uh, a disruptive place. So you might have abusive parents and they they don't take responsibility. They're victims. And so the, the rescuer kicks in and says, OK, I see my siblings being hurt a certain way, or my mother being hurt a certain way, or my father, and I'm going to come in and I'm going to do that rescuing. And they often become a shield um, between somebody that might get hurt in the family and the abuser. And ways, ways we do that can be from staying up in late at night to missing missing school sometimes to say, oh, my mum's not well, to having an overburden of household responsibilities as a child. Um, and it, it seeps into even emotional responsibility. If somebody's sad, then is it my fault that they're sad? Because I'm a rescuer, I should be able to fix it. I should be able to make it better. So that's kind of the history of the rescuer. Um, and what happens with the rescuer is that they they will often attract what we call the victim, okay? Because it makes perfect sense for them to go into the dance between I can save you and yes, I need saving. Um, and often it's, it's from a noble place. They think they're doing something good, you know? We, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we think if somebody is the first to say, come to my house and I'll set up the party or it doesn't matter what time of night, if you need me, just call me. Um, and the place where people get to when they actually end up in therapy is they start to realise that they're so drained and maybe some resentment starts kicking in when they realise that significant others in their life don't do for them what they've done for others. And so they start to re recognise these patterns and what we call the authentic self starts coming up. And what we want to look at for today in, in terms of today is if you know a rescuer or you are a rescuer, if you can define, if you can look at yourself and say, yeah, that's me, I'm the one that essentially sometimes their boundaries are a little bit weak as well. So they find it quite hard to say no because of their drive to to help others, you know, and it can be seen by other types as quite weak and taken advantage of if the rescuer is not aware, okay? Another thing I would say in terms of the adult rescuer would be this, is the, the dark side of this. So although we think, you know, it's great to help people, somebody's fallen over, let's pick them up, let's put a plaster on. And I, I personally have seen tendencies of this, even in, I, I once observed somebody who was um, going for a really um, important meeting and she, she was in the car and she's giving this girl a lift and... She said, oh, have you got water? And she said, yeah, yeah. She says, oh, do you want me to drop you off a little bit closer? And she went, no, no, I'm fine. I can walk there. Okay, make sure you call me when it's done. You know, very loving, very motherly, very kind of, what else can I do? What else can I do to serve you? 
and it works to a certain point. And then what you will find with the rescuer is that they will get just exhausted and they will lose so much of their resources and attract people who are takers. Therefore, without you know, subconsciously not realising that they dis able other people so we're not talking about a disability like a, a genuine kind of somebody's you know a, a mental health issue or a broken leg we're talking about the ability for people to do things for themselves make themselves a cup of tea get themselves to a, an, a, an important meeting you know we're, what we're saying is the rescuer can often be somebody that hinders someone else or gives them an excuse not to do things for themselves, okay? And this is where it's really important that we recognise, although it's great to help people and to support them, um, it is also important to know the shadow side of being any any particular way. I will talk about the victim and the persecutor in perhaps another live, but the rescuer really interests me, partly because I have strong links to it myself, Um and what what does it cause? I think in 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 a way, at some point you begin to realize, I've done all of this for so many people, yet how come, you know, when you start to realize that there's the appreciation that you might have wanted isn't there, or the thanks, or and and then it it starts to make them look almost like they're needy. Salam alaikum. Um, and it's not, it's because they're so deflated that the moment that they ask, the types of people that they've surrounded themselves with by then are people who are takers. So they're naturally going to, the moment they see that you're asking for something, they're going to say, oh, look at you, you're so needy. Um, and it's not, it's just the type of people, it's the boundaries that they've put up. The other way that as a rescuer that you might kind of disable other people is you leave them in a place where they don't have to make choices you know, and they can present themselves in quite a victim state, you know, and, and oh, I, I can't get home at time because of this, oh, it's okay, it's okay, I know that you've been busy, you don't have to come, I'm all right, it doesn't matter if I cook to uh, this dinner, I'll keep it warm for you, and they just keep attracting these people who keep being a victim, being a victim, and they keep picking up the pieces, picking up the pieces, and it just it you you disable the other person by doing that. You know, there's this healthy balance between doing something for someone and also allowing them to do things for themselves. Okay, I've known women who were cutting their husband's nails and and washing their hair. You know, and we saw it in in the kind of the old days. Our mothers who were in service, and we know that there's a love language of service. That some people do love service as a way to express love, but this is not what we're talking about. We can do service, but also receive service. Okay, we can we can do things for people, but not to a point where they are either a victim or a persecutor that they take and take from you and all you've done is disable them that's not where you want to be so my my thing to a rescuer would be this three things I would say um, number one is when you start getting that realization that you're drained where you're doing for everybody, the mother who's doing for her children is signed up to the school club and then the local masjid or the local church and they <laughs> they go to litter picking and then they do all the stuff for their husbands. Slow down and think to yourself, you know, if... Because what is what is really going on? Essentially, go back to the childhood. You begin to realise that the feed for your worthiness is based on what you do for others, Okay. And that's going to be really scary because should somebody decide that they're going to disconnect from you, meaning they don't need any more service from you, you're going to be broken. And, and it creates this idea of love that is false. Love should not be built on what I do for you and what you do for me. That's not love. You know, and it might seem like that when you ask somebody, oh, why do you love them? Oh, it's because, you know, she does my washing and she does my cleaning or he he earns some money. No, that's not why we love one another. You know, love is not based on the condition of who does what for who. OK, it's who we are in our essence that we love. We love somebody unconditionally, whether they did that thing for us or not, we would still love them. And that's the difference. But if you find yourself ever, this is how you will know you're a rescuer. So that was number one that I, I mentioned earlier. Number two is this idea that so you start to realise that you're kind of doing stuff for everybody else and there's kind of no appreciation. 
The second thing is this idea around, how can I put it? You know, you get to the stage where you're doing things for people and then you realise they don't do anything. And they say to you, oh, it's because I can't. And then the rescuer genuinely believes that they can't. They will have this argument that, no, you know, my son isn't able to make his own dinner or my husband can't do that presentation on his own. I really do need to help him. And the only way that you're going to be able to test that is to stop doing it because they are going to keep feeding off you the more you allow them to do that. The more you allow that feeding, they're just going to keep taking from you. So it's really important that you realise that you it kind of disable and what's going to happen is you're going to have your self-worth attached to service and you're going to need a feed honestly each time somebody says I don't need you anymore or we're okay you're going to feel like oh my god what did I do wrong how come they don't need me anymore how come they don't want me and you see this a lot with you know I've been doing the theme around in-laws and and daughter-in-law series I know I've been doing a bit of that and abuse this is how it links in you shouldn't be accepted into a family because you did or didn't do something. And you often hear this if, if you have to look at the subtleties of families. Often in Asian families, you'll hear a mother-in-law praising a daughter-in-law and saying, oh, that daughter-in-law is really great. Did you see the amount of cooking and cleaning she did for me? And the other one, you know, look at her. She just showed up and sat there. Okay, this is a classic example of, you know, if I'm doing, then I'm worthy. And what's going to happen is... There's going to be a time where you can be easily replaced. Somebody else will come along. They will do something that meets the need of the victim, of the taker. And you're just discarded, like you're just nothing. And it's you that's going to be left to pick up those pieces. And that's what I'm kind of untangling for a rescuer that comes into, you know, to therapy is... You know, first of all, seeing that I was so noble, I was so good, I did all these good things, how come? They can't really, genuinely, at that stage, they can't understand how being good could be a problem. And it is true. How can being good possibly be a problem? But then as you start to dive into it, human beings, you know, we don't want to be disabled. Neither do you want to be in a position where your identity is attached to what you do for others. Because one day they're going to turn around and say, I don't need you anymore. And I'll give you an example of this. There was this young girl I saw um, a number of years back. And she had, I don't know how many siblings. They had a big family. And from as far as she could remember, she always was in service of her mother. Um, She looked after the children. She did the chores. She... If her father was ill, she took care of him. She took care of her mother during the births of all the all the siblings. She often didn't attend school because she was taking care of the family. And then they got to a point when she, she described this to me. She said, one night it was really hot. She was from a, a, a hot country. And she said, one night it was really hot and the electricity had gone. And so, you know, in, in hot countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, in India, um, Africa, you use a fan, there's a, like a, a handheld fan that you can use and you manually turn it to keep it warm. And I just, I remember her describing this. She said, all of the siblings were laying down, they were asleep and she was sat there under, you know, the 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 mast that you put up so that the mosquitoes and things don't come, the net. And she said, I was just doing this. And she was trying to keep them cool. So you could see that this child, I mean, she, she said she describes that when she was about, like, maybe about 11 or 12. She has this memory. So think about an 11-year-old who's just a child herself waking up, you know, just to protect the other siblings. And she's fanning. And it's it, she goes, I was sweating to a point my dress was stuck to me. This is how she described it. And then her mum came along. And one of the children were crying, you know, one of the babies was crying and said to her, what are you doing? You know, um, move away. Let me be with my children. And she says, even to this day, I can still feel that, like, I felt like something had crushed my heart. You know, for a moment, she says, look back and I can't differentiate whether they were my children or my mother's children. And this is the level that it can go to if you're an ab- if you're a, a rescuer. Her mother had may put her into this role of doing for the siblings doing for her taking the role on and her worthiness was in that and then within a second her mum came along and said you need to move and she said I just lost like my capacity to know where I belonged she said I was so hurt one that she didn't understand that I was I was sticking to myself trying to keep them warm I was 
trying to look after them. I did my best. Um, and, you know, she she came because she had eating disorders and it, it stemmed from that. She ended up with a lot of problems with her eating, trying to gain control, still for a long time, um, still being the rescuer throughout school and so on and so forth. And that's how I met her. But we found that early memory around how she functioned at home. So look for yourselves. One of the things I always say is ask yourselves, was I, do I know somebody who does that? Um, do I play a part in that? And that's a hard one. You know, am I a taker? Do I like it when somebody just does things for me and I can just sit around and, and, and it's okay? Or am I observant that that's what's happening? And do I disable myself by doing that? You know, that's number one. And if you are a rescuer, how do you disable others? Whether that's a husband or a friend, you know, or like the description I gave you with the girl in the car, you know, if she can go and do that meeting, she can get herself a bottle of water. You could just say, you know, there was no need to go to that extent of literally just carrying her to the door, you know, because it leaves that person believing that I can't do anything independently. And the last thing is for yourself is don't, if you attach that to your identity of doing means I'm worthy, you're going to, you're ending for a really big crash at some point because you're going to, like the moment that somebody doesn't need you or they get a bit independent, you're going to look for your next feed. There's actually, we actually call it the cycle of looking for that next person that's going to want to, you're going to help. And it's a feed, it's actually an energy. What can I do next? What can I do next? And you're going on this on this treadmill of who can I help next? Who can I, and you, your worthiness comes from somebody praising you, somebody just saying to you, oh, you know what, I'm so happy that you did that for me. But it makes them very powerful because when they don't need you anymore or they find another service giver, they're just going to discard you and then you're going to be the one that's worrying about how do I find myself worth in the world? And then it complicates your ideas of love, absolutely will complicate your ideas of love. You will end up with people who are either narcissistic um the takers you you will end up in a in in if not a lot some partial unhealthy relationship because of your identity around this idea that the only way i'm going to get worthiness is doing and and i i'll i'll give you another example of this often when women are meeting a, a brother for marriage and i'm talking from a muslim perspective this is the question that's asked, like, what do you expect from me? And, and the, the husband will say, what things will you do? And she says, oh, you know, I'll cook and I'll clean and I'll do all of this. And, you know, I always say, like, when we're, when we're having these conversations at that level, there's something quite not right. Um, and it was a real eye-opener. Like I said, this is one that's close to home. So when I met my husband and I had come from a kind of a rescuing background. I asked him the question, I said, what do you expect? Like, that was the question I asked. And, and he's like, what do you mean? I said, you know, like, I've spoken to a few brothers and they always ask me this question, so I might as well just ask it you first. Um, what do you expect? And he said, in what way? And I said, well, one of them said, they expect me to cook like this and tidy up and visit his parents this many times. And I said, I don't expect anything. Um... It's going a bit dark on my screen, so I'm not sure what's going on. I think it's getting darker outside, so I'll get going. Um, so, and he said, I don't expect anything. And I, I said, what do you mean? I said, then how will, what will I do? And he says, what do you mean, what will you do? I said, what about the ironing? He said, I can iron for myself. I said, what about cooking? And he said, well, I can actually cook. I went, all right, okay. And I knew in that moment, like, oh my God, like, I, sh I shouldn't go into this because... I won't be able to do anything, you know, this idea of doing something for the other person because, and what was deeper than that is if I don't do something for him, I'm just going to put the light on because it's just so dark. Um, oh, this light's not very good either, but I'm going to put it on. So if I don't do anything, then somehow that's going to hinder how I'm loved. And that's the key. You want to connect it to your self-worth, okay? And then I asked him, so, so, so like, what will happen? Like, how will we, I couldn't, I, I genuinely, this is how confused I was. I was like, I don't understand. He said, but 
I, I'm not getting married to have somebody serve me or to look after me or to do things for me. I said, so why are you getting married? Because I, this, is, this is what a rescuer will ask. Like, why are you actually getting married? Um, and you'll hear it. You, you, as you start to do the work, you start to recognise who's what. And, um, and he said, no, it's just companionship. It's, you know, my friend, someone to talk to, someone to get through life with. And can you see the difference in balanced love? And I'll give you the example of that compared to my previous marriage. I remember when I first met him and the first thing he said was, oh, you know, you'll be perfect for my mum. My mum will love you. And, you know, you, 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 you tick all the boxes that, you know, we expect as a daughter-in-law. So I was dutiful. I was kind. All of the things that I would do for them, you know. And at the time, I thought that was perfect. Like, I was like, whoa, yes, you know, I found my perfect match because I can be in service, therefore I'll be worthy and they can just take and take and it's all good because that's how I understood love. Um, and it's, that's how deep it goes. So you, you want to start to recognise what purpose am I serving for? Absolutely do it for the sake of Allah. That doesn't mean I don't cook. That doesn't mean I don't iron his clothes from time to time. Or that doesn't mean I don't make coffee and tea, don't, don't get me wrong, we do that. But if those things weren't there, I would still be loved. That's the difference. Whether those things are there or not, you're loved for who you are, not for what you do. And a rescuer needs to be loved because of what they can do for the other person. And the more you're that way, the more you attract those kind of people, narcissistic types, abusive types, that will want you only to serve them. But that's not love, that's servitude. <laughs> and that, 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 just, that is not love. And when you experience love the way it's supposed to be, you'll realise the difference. So I'm going to end it here because it's Maghrib. That's why it's gone so dark. And I apologise about the yellow light and stuff in the room. Um, if you have any other questions about the rescuer, please let me know because I'm happy to have a conversation. Have a look for yourselves. Ask yourselves, you know, do I need approval because I do things for others? If I didn't do things, and would I be okay? Or would I feel empty that they didn't, I didn't do something for them? Do I associate love with doing things? Because those are signs for you to know whether you are um, a victim, I suppose, of rescuing. Jazakallah khairan for listening. Oh, I have a question. Let me have a look. Okay. Yeah, so I have a, um, one of the a comment that's been made which highlights kind of what I'm saying, mirrors what I'm saying, that the family will often only approve of, you know, this person when they do some service. And that's key, honestly. It, most families, with, with Asian families, what I'm finding in more of the abusive families, it is, it is structured that way. When you do for us, when you show up, when you dress a certain way, when you make your father-in-law a cup of tea, when you go to see your mothers when I tell you to, when you're in service of us, you're a great person. You're the perfect beau, you know, you're the perfect daughter-in-law. But when you don't do those things, then you're not, you know? And, and that's scary, that's not how it should be. We, we are not supposed to be in relationships where people like us because we do something for them. That's not how it works. I, my daughter doesn't have to do things for me, for me to love her. I should love her for who she is, the fact that she exists, that she's with me. You know, I appreciate her for all that she is, not because if she stopped doing something for me, all of a sudden, okay, like, I'm going to discard you now. I don't, I don't need you because you don't serve me. But... If it helps you as a rescuer, the other way to look at it is if you continue to take on the responsibility for others and do so much for them, you disable them and it's not helpful for them either. So you have this core of love and, and care. If it helps to, to frame it that way, do it that way and say, I'm actually doing them a service by not doing as much for them because they need to learn to do things for themselves to survive in the world, you know? What if I'm not there? What if something were to happen? What are we going to do then? So that's another way to help you shift slowly away from. And the other thing is recognise as you're doing it, kind of the emotions that come up, am I going to be loved? And start to tell, start to recognise that and, and, and find people in the world who don't attach to you just because of service. They attach to you for those deeper reasons, kind of the example I gave with my husband is... Look, I just, I want companionship. I want to talk, like, be your friend, you know? I, 
I'm not marrying somebody to do my housework and do my like cleaning and my cooking. That's not what we marry marry each other for. Those are great things to have as skills in the marriage. They help each other, of course, but that shouldn't be the core of why we form relationships. Jazakallah khairan for listening. I hope that was helpful. And inshallah, I will see you soon. Well, I have another question. So what if they expect to keep asking you? Yeah. So this is a really good one. When you recognise that, if you recognise those tendencies of being a rescuer and then people continue to ask you, which they will because you've probably got yourself in that place of being a rescuer. So you've probably surrounded yourself unconsciously, subconsciously with people who are takers. So just as hard it is hard as it is for you to walk away, the takers are going to find it equally hard if you walk away. They will say, I can't believe you don't do this for me. I can't believe you don't love me. Uh, what's wrong with you? Why have you changed? You're such a bad person for not doing the dishes. There's going to be a lot of stuff that comes up for them because their their identity is being questioned. What I would say is look at what it does to you. So if you don't do something and they continue to ask you, are you able to put a boundary up and say, look, I'm sorry, but I can do I can do two nights a week or something, you know, of service, but two nights I need some rest. Are you able to do that? And when you do that, what's what comes up? Because you are going to get challenged by them, but you're also going to have the biggest challenge is within yourself. Because what's going to happen is the biggest thing that's going to come up is the fear that you're going to lose them. Especially if you're in a marriage or with in-laws, you know, it's a massive fear to say all of a sudden I'm, I've realised I'm a rescuer and realised that the only way that they're going to approve of me is when I do these things. So when you stop, what do you think is going to happen? Naturally, they're going to say you're a bad person, you're a bad daughter-in-law, did your parents not bring you up right? I've heard it all, you know, from so many sisters and myself. Um, really derogatory because, because if you think about it, they're not getting their feed either. They they expect that it's like it's 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 a sudden cut off for them, a supply that's gone. But you have to because you're the one that's in awareness. You have to kind of allow yourself to go through that and say even if they disapprove, I don't need them to approve on that, and I'm still okay. I think that's what it is, and it is hard. I'm not saying it happens overnight, especially if you're surrounded by lots of takers in the first place. But as you do it, you will realise that when you shift, the world shifts. So you're going to make a move, and then they're going to make a move, you know, and they're going to come at you at a certain way because they're missing out on something. It's going to be a natural thing that's going to happen. But you have to have that in yourself that, no, enough's enough. Um, I'm not going to do that. And I know with that is going to come this shadow side of them, these this abuse or this name calling or I'm not good enough, um, and but am I going to be okay with knowing that that's not love and I'm still okay as I am even if I don't do something for them and that's something to do with them. It's not my thing that I'm carrying. Work on you and that's hard. It is because when you're in families, you want approval. You know, you don't want to be hearing your mother-in-law downstairs saying, oh, you know, she's like this, she's like that, or your husband and your mother-in-law, father-in-law talking about it, or your husband coming up and saying, you're a waste of space and you don't do nothing. And the only time, you, you know, he appraises you is when you do something for his family. That's not love. They need a servant for that. If they want service, they need a servant. We're not servants. And that's not how love works. So I'm going to end it here because Maghrib is really going to get late. Jazakallah khairam for watching. Assalamu alaikum.